We worked with the Ojibwe Culture Foundation between 2006 and 2011, and then from 2011 to 2017, so August 2017, I worked for Lakeview School in Chiging with a program called the Anishinaabemowin Revival Program. Prior to that, 2002 to 2006, I worked for Chiging First Nation uh, on a program called Kinamadok, and that means they're teaching each other. They are teaching each other. The idea there was we have all these land claim research going on. We wanted to make our own uh, archives there and record our elders. So I've been recording elders since 2002. Well, I should actually say when I did my master's program, I, I recorded elders in that as well. So I've been recording elders since 99, I think, 1999. And then when I recorded the elders, my idea was that we need to set down a record of natural speech instead of how when people learn to speak Ojibwe they, they sometimes will use a book I use books I don't mind them and courses where you just learn to construct sentences which is fine too but at one point you need to actually transgress that sentence and word building blocks and get into actual natural sounding speech so I decided that uh, I was getting tired of just learning to speak, uh, say, Anishina and stuff like that. But we had to actually make it so that you learn, have something to aspire to. So the programs, I'm no longer affiliated with any program because I'm actually in the first year PhD history program at York University. But I have uh, exp experience in the preservation of language as well as uh, publication of our language, as well as uh, learning to speak it as a second language. Although I'm not fluent, some people think I am, but I, I learned quite a bit. What I wanted to do with these programs was to get our school programs have a more enriched Nishnabemwin program, right from elementary school, grade one, and I saw it going all the way to university. And so that's why I recorded these elders, to actually get them to share different stories. Some are just silly stories, funny stories. Others are pretty big legends. And then others are actual historical tales. So I, I wanted the whole age group, and I believe in this lifelong learning, that uh, what, we, what I found is that you, you should actually be working with your kids to try and learn and reinforce as much of what they've learned in school at the kitchen table at home, either at the breakfast table when you are together and then we're at the dinner table when you are together, to actually start learning to speak about eating as, at least. Anyway, we did a program like that, a uh, breakfast program at Lakeview School. And uh, so we were trying to get families to work together on that. It, it didn't really, I don't know how much, how successful it was we had some of this, the teaching staff at Lakeview School actually were able to uh, learn some of those languages and we, we used different uh, tools because we know people are busy. So we made uh, different units on a software program that's online called Quizlet. And you could actually use that to practice learning the nouns. And then after you learn the nouns, then you learn a verb about it. And then after you learn a verb about it, you learn another verb, a descriptive verb first, I should say, and then you learn a verb of you acting upon it. And then, uh, so this is what we would call building it up. So at first, let's say you, the, the, the adult or the student, the, this is actually part of the program at Lakeview School, they'll learn the word mishimin for uh, apple, and then they'll learn the word damin for uh, strawberry. But these are both different categories of uh, nouns. They're one's animate, the other's inanimate. So what we wanted them to do is to learn how to differentiate the two because if you don't know the difference between them, you're going to make a mistake because the next part is you choose a verb and that verb will actually have to be in agreement with whether the item is animate or inanimate. So you can't say manapogoze demen. you got to say manapogot demen. Likewise, you can't say manapogot shimen. You got to say manapogoze shimen. So that means just the apple or the strawberry tastes good. 
Next, you gotta then say, I wanna eat an apple. So you'd say, Ndamwa Mashimin. But you can't say, Ndamwa Damin. You gotta say, Nmijin. Nmijin Damin. I'm eating a strawberry. But you can't say, Nmijin Mashimin. So you gotta sort this all out. And what we do is, through, do, through drills, we get them to try and learn that. So a lot of people kind of uh, look down on these drills. But when that's how I ended up learning what I know. As I was drilling myself, I was learning it, writing it, trying to practice what was animate, inanimate, and, and choosing the right verbs that went with it. Because you don't get to speak to speakers all the time in our current uh, uh, life, uh, current society. A second language learner sometimes doesn't have the privilege of having their parent or grandparent who speaks anymore. And so you actually have to supplement this void with uh, other materials. So books are going out of fashion and a lot of people can't read the language. But now what we got are these uh, electronic stuff that people are using a lot. So, But you got to structure it in a way and people got to stick with it and stay with it and use it and then speak it. So, the, my thing is the age group has actually been lifelong learners. And to try and build into that, that the parents and the children are learning together. We had one family actually that were doing quite well, but then that's the thing, you got to sustain it and then you got to move, you got to move past it on to the next thing. So if, you, the, if the kid, the child actually was able to say, Ndamwa Mashimin, I'm, I'm eating an apple. Then they were able to say, Ndamwa, you can't say, Ndamwa Mashimin Manapogoze. You got to change the verb Manapogoze into another form. You got to conjugate it, what the linguists say, conjugate it. So the children were actually able to do this in uh, grade three at Lakeview School. They would say, Ndamwa Manapogoze Mashimin. I'm eating a tasty apple, or I'm eating an apple that tastes good. So they were able to do that, and that's a lot more than. Uh, some college and university students that, uh, and it took me like five years to learn how to do that. So similarly, you, the child would then say, Mi jin men pogok demen. I'm eating a tasty strawberry. So that was what we were able to get them to do was start building less, uh, building sentences and then using multiple verbs in one sentence, which has actually been a challenge for people. So we wanted all this programming to actually fit in with what the stories the elders are telling. So when I, like I mentioned, I record these elders, we, that's the goal. We want the students to actually be able to sit there and listen to an elder tell a story and then preferably paraphrase that back and retell that story back to somebody else. We're not there, to, we're not there yet. We're not nowhere near there yet. But the thing is we have it recorded and we're trying to look at different methodologies of how we can get the students to actually do this. And the, the other thing that I've often talked about with why I would record these elders, I look at that as the well, the well of our language, in a sense, as we're, we're losing our elders in our community anyway, and they're not being replaced by speakers. So we need to actually document that and make a library or an archive, but I call it a well. Because back in the day, people would come to the well, get water and take it home. So that's the idea here with this digital archive with these stories, is that people then come and listen to these stories online, and if they have enough understanding, then they're able to take something back to their kids, to their family, to their kitchen table, and share that with, with others. So that's why I call that a well. You come and get your water at the well, community well, take it back to your house, pour water for the rest of your family or cook with that or whatever you're going to do with that water, wash up. You're going to then share that water in your house. And that's how I look at this. The other thing is now you've used that water up, now you got to go back to the well. So that's why I call it a well. You keep going back to that. So what we've done with those elder interviews is we've transcribed them word for word and then sometimes we put an English translation, but I didn't want to do that. And what I did instead is we, we made a glossary to go with each, each transcript. So the idea is that if somebody is really, really wants their language, they can follow along the elder who's saying, 
with the transcript and read along with that. A lot of people say they're visual learners. So when people talk about being a visual learner, I often thought they were talking about images. But others actually mean that they have to see it written and match what that person is saying to the written word. And then they start to understand the writing system. So I've seen people do this. I was teaching adults last year at Lakeview School. And they were actually able to start uh, listening to these videos. And that was the assignment was, uh, I had, uh, let's say I had five students on a given night. We did a 10 minute video and each, each student in the class did a two minute section to transcribe. Of course, they didn't get 100%, but they got a lot of the words in there. And then we went through it and covered it and we transcribed it again. And then the next task was then we made the glossary, put down the words, and then they came up with the translation themselves. And then after they had the translation, then they understood the word, and then they were able to then try and use that in their everyday life in some actual uh, different different ways. So when uh, to get back to this uh, this adult la language class, then one of the students that I was I was really impressed with and quite pleased with her progress, she would say, "Oh, I'm going to bust this out tomorrow on." Uh, on the speaker at, at work. So then she would go in and she'd, she'd try whatever new word she learned at the, at the class and then she would say that to the speaker and then the, the speaker at work was getting really impressed with her, her progress as well. And so, so he liked that and they both built a relationship on that. So those are, to me, those are some of the successes that we have with this that program. It was the, the adults that were coming to that program in the evening actually started to build up their comprehension of oral Mishnah Bimwin. And then secondly, they were actually building up their utility of writing Mishnah Bimwin. And then uh, furthermore, then they were actually building up their communicative competence by taking it out into the community and trying it with different, uh, different speakers. So the same thing with the kids. One of the things that we, we fell, fell upon was some of them we tried to get them to use the language more and that was the that's the hard part is the kids don't they don't make it in their head that that they actually have to do this they, that they can do this outside of the classroom they seem to think uh Ojibwe is just for the the one hour that we have them so we got to try and get them to speak it outside the classroom more and so we made units uh for them uh, especially uh, in November, this was a successful one. It was a unit on hockey. So we were trying to get them to do a bit more on hockey. And then uh, for June, like we got them, uh, we have a powwow at Lakeview School in uh, June. And so we got them uh, a, a unit on powwow as well. So we got them to say different things like, I'm wearing a shawl, I'm wearing leggings, I'm wearing a bustle those kind of things and so they, they had to learn those words and then we put an interactive game to say the boy is wearing a bustle, the, the boy is wearing a roach, all these kinds of uh, words that uh, and it wasn't really what we're trying to do is not get them to memorize the phrases not stock memorization we're actually getting them to learn the words and that they are then able through these exercises and drills to select the correct words that go with the correct clothing item. So, for instance, again, there are there are animate and inanimate clothing items. So, one an example of a animate clothing item is a is a necklace. So you'd say napkawagan, biskwa napkawagan. I'm wearing a necklace. But then, if you you have other you talk about that roach, miskwazagan, miskwazagan biskan. I'm wearing a roach. So you gotta learn the right word, the right verb. You gotta say biskan or biskwa. So it's it's you can't just say one for the other, you're gonna be making an, an error. So the kids were learning that, the students were learning that. That's the 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 learning objective was to get them to differentiate between the two and then to choose the right verb and then to use their language and to, to try and uh, sort out information. The other thing is, uh, in this regard with the indigenous education in that sense, we didn't want it to just all be about legends and then, or 
people keep referring back to this um, school year, the calendar school year, and w we did that too. And but that actually, when you look at that, that's been done in the eighties, late eighties, and uh, people still keep remaking that, but they don't add on to it, and it should actually spiral up. So what we decided to do is we're going to try and uh, make that information, spi I, I say spiral up, in the sense that in September to June, you, maybe you cover the same type of activities, but each year you add on more complex information, and you make that explicit, that you're actually adding on more information. So the kids, uh, when they do the Pomelo stuff, maybe in grade one they learn, they learn simple, simple material about uh, how to dance, what they're dancing and that. And then the following year they learn more about the clothing and then they learn to, to uh, describe it more and talk about it more. And then uh, after a while the idea is then they, they start to talk about different actors because when I mean actors, there's seven actors in Ojibwe. I, you, me, he, we, exclusive, we, inclusive, you, plural, and they. So. We have all these things to try and teach them, but each of those are indicated by different uh, affixes and suffixes and prefixes on a, on a word. So it's a lot, a lot of information that we're trying to convey. And again, just to make it ref make a explicit reference back to what the elders are saying, those videos. Then, after a while, the students, adult students, and the uh, elementary school students, when they're listening to those videos, they actually then start to listen or hear about, uh, hear the suffixes that they've been learning, and then they start to understand their their actual oral comprehension is increased, because then they know that if they hear, hear at the end of a word, me, then they know it means uh, we. And then if they hear at the end of a word, wak, a verb, then they know it's they. So they started listening to these audio clues and they're starting to pick up a bit on who is actually doing what. So you, you see these little little bits of success when they're, when they're going through. And if you listen to an elder speak in Ojibwe, it's really fast because it's just natural speech. They're not slowing down to be deliberately and uh, speak slowly and deliberately. They're just talking. They want to communicate. We want to get the students to see and to actually aspire to speak that fluidly. That's the goal. So that's why we rely on those elder interviews to get them to actually, uh, the students to start thinking, this is where I want to be, this is how well I want to speak, and this is the command I want to have of our language. So I look at that as lifelong learning and that they end up looking at uh, trying to have, in, in second language theory, they talk about this, that it should your language program and your language lessons should be just beyond your comprehension, but not too far beyond your comprehension. If it's too far beyond your comprehension, you get discouraged. But if it's just beyond your comprehension, but you have enough that you're almost understanding, then that actually inspires you to try and learn and understand more. And it's kind of, the analogy is the carrot on the stick that you actually say, oh, I'm almost understanding this. If I just knew this, I'd be able to understand. So when you try and learn a bit more, and you try to incorporate that into your learning. So we wanted to blend that in there. So if we just made this all about legends and about history and about the past, it would I think it would fall on the it would fall down, in a sense, because then we're what they would say is we're ossifying our language, we're making it uh, something static. But if you listen to speakers today that are that grew up with it and they they talk about anything. They can talk about anything in our language, and our language is still growing, but just amongst that group, that age group. We want that growth, language growth, to start occurring at elementary school student level, and that's what we're aspiring to do, and it's, it's, a hard, it's hard work, but we want them to actually learn to actually manipulate words at what linguists would call the morphological level. That's where our language gets really descriptive. That's where people really start to have a fun time changing the pronunciation of words and that's why you see Anishinaabe people always laughing when they're talking to each other because they, they end up making these puns. They change the word and they, and it, they start laughing. So to me, uh, I know a lot of people get into language, and I did myself, 
uh, to really understand more about myself, my history and that. But the, the actual thing is that sometimes people actually just want to get in on the joke and they want to learn to laugh about uh, how our native sense of humor is conveyed in the Anishinaabe Emwin. So I think that we really need to expand more on on our, uh, and not make our language such a sacred thing. I think we got to make it look more, take it back a bit more and make it an everyday thing and something that we, we really use, how the, speak, the actual speakers use it now to just uh, joke around it. And that's what, what I think we're kind of losing in some sense is that people just want to use it to pray to the ancestors. And that's, that's a necessary part. But uh, if the, in the end, if that's all we're doing, it's going to end up like Latin, where you just use it for prayer. And we don't want it, we don't want, that's not, I don't think that's the goal. Our goal is to actually revitalize this language in our everyday lives and in our everyday education. So we need a more expansive uh, definition of culture. There's a lot of people to, still to a lot of Anishinaabe people, hockey is a big part of their culture. And then to say that it isn't, and that, that and maybe some of the people don't bother going to a powwow, or maybe they're not mid they, they're just, uh, they, they play hockey, they, they go to bingo, but they want to speak their language. And I think that that's actually one part that of our language programs that actually should uh, be, be encouraged. Mind you, I think there's enough damn bingo in our language programs anyway. Um, I don't bother with that, but uh, that's what people want. So I think uh, we got a whole lifelong learning journey, and that's what, what this program and what I've been working at for a number of years is try to make varied language materials for varied age groups and try to match that material to those age groups wherein it actually builds upon their motivation to learn more. Whether or not I've been successful at that is uh, up to other people. Um, I know I, I just keep going and um, I try to reflect upon what we've made and trying to and try to test the units, see what they're actually acquiring. One of the main things, though, that we found with the Anishinaabe M1 Revival Program at Lakeview was that uh, retention was an issue. So we got to work on, work on that. So after the kids would do, the students would do a unit for a month or two months, they actually were, were acing it, and they were really doing really well. They, they really surprised me, a number of them. But now uh, it's two years since that child was able to, to, we used these cards, these visual aids, and they were just random. So this one student, what we do is like, this gets back to that apple and, uh, and strawberry story I was talking about. But this one was uh, turkey and, uh, and roast beef. So you, you, our, our co my co-worker would make a card. I told her, make a card. First was just the roast beef and turkey. So then the children learned the words for that. Then the next part was she put a finger, a thumbs up or a thumbs down to mean that uh, they like it or they don't like it. And then on the other corner of the card, she put either a nose or a mouth. So meaning that you smell it or you taste it. So then the, the kids ended up learning to decode that, said that I like both uh, roast beef. I like the taste of turkey. Next thing we did was we either put it in a fryer or in an oven. So then the kids ended up learning to say, I like roast beef that is, I like beef that is roasted, or I like beef that is fried, meaning hamburger. And then the, the turkey was, I like deep fried turkey. Now they have these big deep fried tur the deep fryers for turkey. Or I like roasted turkey, turkey cooked in an oven. And the kids were able to do that. And then they were able to make that into, turn that into a negative sentence. And this was where it blew me away that they said, I don't, no, I do not like turkey that is roasted in the oven, which was just uh, awesome. I was, uh, I was blown away that they were able to do that. So trying to make it everyday language use, but trying to also be mindful at the same time. There's a tension between everyday language use and then also trying to make um, these cultural, cultural in the sense of what you do every day and then cultural traditions. So looking at uh, cooking turkey and stuff, but we also had that whole unit was on food, 
and we had deer meat and moose meat included in there as well, as well as all kinds of fish. So we, we try to cover the gamut there of, uh, of people's everyday, everyday lives and everyday diet to try and make that unit as uh, effective as, as possible. Well, to me, in indigenous education, I kind of, myself, I, I try to just say Anishinaabe education. I don't like, I, for different reasons, when we lump ourselves all in together as an indigenous education, because indigenous can mean Navajo, Diné, or it can mean Tlingit, or it can be, well, we say Nodaway, but they call themselves Haudenosaunee, and they have different ways than we do. So I like to, I prefer to say that we're trying to strive, we're striving for Anishinaabe education. So in the principles, this is, of course, a lot of people would say it's just that your mind, body, spirit, uh, that's all, all a part of that, that you actually try to put those all together and develop all of those together on oh, your body. So those four elements of your of yourself based on a medicine wheel that people talk about. And then there's different teachings that uh, I've heard that uh, at different from different elders that we try to incorporate, but we don't really make it so explicit or, or overt in these language programs per se. We try to make it more imbued and more subtle uh, that you, you actually have it in there. Because part of, to me, part of an inherent part of an Anishinaabe education is that it was intuitive. When we look at our storytelling tradition, the storytellers used to tell the story. They didn't explain it. They didn't explain what it meant. You were to think about what it meant. And then... When you had a question, then you'd go tell, ask the storyteller or your grandparent, why, why did this happen in this story? What part, why does this happen there? Then you reflect on that more. And then that story is supposed to help you. And that's uh, what the Anishinaabe education is, what they, in the Jagannath call a reflexive. The, these stories are reflexive, as well as these teachings. And then that's why in our language, there's two ways that I've seen people translate the word teachings. One say kinamage win, but that would be more properly uh, pedagogy teaching. Kinamage he teaches kinamage win, the act of teaching, and then the other word when I see for teachings is kinamadwin, kinamadwinan, and when you make it that you say kinamawa I taught that person, but if we're teaching each other we say kinamadme we're teaching each other. And when you add that D at the end of the word, it makes it a mutually reflexive verb. So when we say kinomadwin, it means then the, the teachings in the sense that it's reflective. That it means it's, it's actually impacting you, but you are also impacting it. There's, a, there's a, a deeper philosophical meaning of why that word is structured that way, kinomadwin. Kinomadwin, it's actually something that's a back and forth. There's a back and forth element to that. And that's what our our philosophy of languages, in a sense. And uh, to me, I think of that more as, uh, as in the sense that there's a spirit in that teaching. Not necessarily Nanabojo or Pais or whoever. There's just a spirit in that actual teaching, in the story, in the words, or in the image, or in the design, the motif. And then that is what is to elicit in you uh, thought, thought process. And then as you think about that more, deliberate upon that more, then that's when it actually starts to impact you and then you, you could start to say you're becoming educated for that. So I, I think of that as Anishinaabe education. I used to talk to this one fellow, Eddie King, was his name, Eddie Kingba, and what I liked how he, he talked about this, he had a different teaching of a uh, different configuration of the seven grandfathers, but I think it was five of them. Five of them were the same as the the ones that are in the Mishomas book, and two were different, but they're essentially the same. Anyway, we're quibbling over English words. But to me, what he used to talk about a lot was the arrowhead, and he'd use this on these pictographs that are at petroglyphs. Sorry, that are at the Peterborough petroglyphs, and then he'd talk about the the three. The arrow has three points. And he says, when you, when, you, when you draw your bow back with that arrow, and you're looking at that arrowhead, and then you're reminded of that first point, 
and you think when you're going to take that life, do I practice the seven grandfathers with Mother Earth? And then that means it's you're talking about all of creation. And when you're looking at that point on the arrowhead, you're looking at the kill, kill that deer or whatever it is. Am I doing this in an honorable way, in a truthful way, in a humble way? Am I going to respect this animal? Do I love this animal? And then the next point on that arrowhead, same thing. Do I love the Creator? Do I respect the Creator? Am I truthful with the Creator? And then that last point on that arrowhead, do I have the seven grandfathers with myself? And then that was what that was as a mnemonic device that Eddie King used to talk about. This is a mnemonic device. Everything that we used to use as Anishinaabe people actually had that element in there. So then he says, once you, you reassured yourself that you practice the seven grandfathers with the creation, with the creator and with yourself, then you were able to take that life. So I look at it that way as well. And then other times I go to a, a sweat with um, Shike, call him Shike, our, our uncle. And then he would say that too. He says, maybe you know the seven grandfathers, I don't know. He'd say, he always asks questions, that's his teaching style, asking rhetorical questions. Then he'd say, you know, it isn't just this physical realm we're talking about. There's actually, are you able to practice seven grandfathers in the spirit world? Are you able to practice seven grandfathers with your senses, with your sight, with your hearing, with your smell, with your touch? He says, are you able to practice those seven grandfathers with your five senses? So he has, uh, when we think about it that way, then we start to get an idea a bit more about what this idea of holistic education is. And we put those together, what these different elders are teaching, putting together, then that's when we get a better idea of what this Anishinaabe education is, how we're trying to convey to students and again, I just have to reiterate that to me, Anishinaabe education is never ending. That it's a lifelong journey. And so the same thing with our language. We always try to learn more and more with our language, but also with this uh, spirit. Trying to learn with the spirit and then trying to learn with your fellow Anishinaabe, as well as you, you try to learn more about your body, your mind, your spirit, and then also your heart. So you're trying to learn all this time to put this all in balance. And of course, everyday life, something's going to throw something off balance there. And then it's your job to put that all back in balance. So that's the aspiration of Anishinaabe education, is that minamadzuin. And everyone, I shouldn't say everyone knows that, but you hear that a lot, you see it a lot. But sometimes I think it just and, and it has ended up becoming a catchphrase or a slogan. And I don't know if people really look at it anymore as, okay, we want Minamadzuman, but what does that mean? How are we going to make this Minamadzuman? How are we going to make our education Minamadzuman? How is that child going to understand that Minamadzuman? On his engine, Sastam Watgun Takbanojiak Wanda Minamadzuman. How do they understand this Minamadzuman? How are they going to live that? So, to me, that's the. The thing of Anishinaabe education is Minamadzuan, trying to strive for Minamadzuan. And then the, over the next 10 years, that's just the thing is you just keep trying to learn more and more, put it all together more. The work I do, record different elders, talk to different elders, write their story out. And uh, some of it is teachings, some of it's life stories, some of it's jokes. But then I also do archival research and I found in the archives a lot of different uh, materials that we actually haven't uh, utilized in our education anymore. Our chiefs, they used to write in Ojibwe. Our chiefs used to write in our language and people now, when I first started talking about this, people didn't believe me and they, when I started writing different stories that the elders told, this was back in the early 2000s, I was told a number of different times, you shouldn't write that down, don't write that down. Our language was never written, they'd say to me. And I was so happy when I found those documents written in Ojibwe back in the 1860s and well, as early as the 1820s up to 1910. We had a, a prolific period of writing in Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe, our ancestors, 
uh, the Nuevo Noir. They wrote in their in their language that time, and they used that to communicate with each other, with the Pope, with the Minister of Indian Affairs, with the, who they call the Chigama, with each other, and uh, so it was a tool. And that's what I think we get mixed up with sometimes. Is that's not that's not the end result we want. We want that's just a tool to get more closer to where we want to be with our language by revitalizing it using it in different domains and in different areas of our life and then that reading and writing is here to stay basically in English but I think it should be also in our language that we we do a bit more reading and writing so I found a lot of different historic documents written that still haven't trickled down into universities yet let alone elementary schools so this kind of stuff should actually be put into our elementary school programs that they're actually starting, the, the elementary school students should start to look at our compositions uh, of, our, of uh, our story, of our history, and of geography, biology. We could do a whole lot of work. One of the things that I wanted to do in a science-based manner, a more methodological manner, was to look at all these words of plants and then you actually look at the word of the plant and some of them are just named for how they look some of them are named for their use but there are actually a, st a few of them quite a bit of them that have a suffix that indicate a characteristic and therefore a, a way of uh, typifying them or categorizing them the way a scientist would in Latin so we would uh, we could actually look at those put those all together and then try and deduce why our ancestors named that plant that after that attribute and then why it's the same as this one. So for example, I'll give you an example. We say Nakanashk for actual bulrush, Nakanashk. And then we say Pakwayashk for a cattail. And then we also Chigamiwashk. There's a, a, apparently a different type of species of reed that uh, grows out by Lake Superior and they call that Chigami Washk. There was all in the Nawashk, Ashk or Washk. And then those, actually the same word, Weengashk for sweet grass, Ashk again is in there. So those, that ending actually would refer to a plant that grows in swampy or watery conditions. So you put all those words together then that's when you start to, okay here, uh, this is how Anishinaabe people categorize these different types of plants. And then the same thing would you'd say, and that's for a strawberry plant. Same thing for a blackberry plant. Is the ending. So you got to look at these, put them together. How do these fit together? What's, what was their typification or what was their categorization? So there's a lot of work we got to do that we would actually do with these biology, uh, plant biology, um, and and ecology, and then also a lot of words for our our geography that we're just I shouldn't say ignoring. We we just there's just so much work, so much damn work that we have to do that we just seem to fight over money. That's that's the sad part about it. That I wish we we would just actually say, okay, you you guys deliver to. Devote your energy to making a unit on geography. You guys make one on history. You guys make one on biology. And then, and then make it for grade 2, grade 3, grade 4. But we don't get any coordinated, coordinated uh, of work out of uh, groups. Everyone's competing with each other. We'd get a lot further ahead if, if within the next 10 years, if we actually sat down and did that, and we actually sat down and made a group that says, okay, you're going to do this one and research it, not just, not just translate what the white man has written. That's what's going on right now. I got a thing from the Metro Toronto Zoo and they wrote a thing about turtles and frogs and stuff. And then they wrote it in English, which is fine. And then they sent it off to somebody to get translated. So that's a literal translation of a white man's knowledge about frogs and turtles. And then you even have a name for different turtles there that they, they didn't even bother to look at what the turtle's name actually is in the Nishnab Emwin. So they said the Western Painted Turtle. 
and that turtle actually has a name in Mishnah. And when, but these people who translated, they just said, uh, But that, that turtle's name is actually Muskwadesi. Then they had another, I forget the, I forget the name they put for that, Blanding Spotted Turtle. They made a, they said blanding, I don't think they said this, but this is, this is an exaggeration. Blanding a doe, she came and blanding spotted turtle. But actually the word for that, the name for that is boskado. They didn't bother doing research, they just went ahead and translated the whole thing. So we, we, we have to actually have a, I was actually hoping that Mishnah Ben Wintek would have been a, an institute to actually pull this all together. And they say, here's how we're going to go about this. These are the critical issues we need to look at. These are the issues we need to develop. And here's how we're going to go about it. We're going to go about it in a coordinated fashion and try and get this all together so that in Lake Huron area, because we have to do this by dialects, and they, that uh, I just see there's too much dialect affinity. Whatever we make in, in the Lake Huron area, the people out in Kenora aren't going to use it. I just, I just know that. If we, if we make it, they might, which would be good if they translate it to their dialect and insert different words, and then it would be of some use. We could do it that way as well. But sometimes I've just seen people out west, they look at it, they look down and on our dialect, and they put down our dialect because they call us uh, language butchers. But there's a lot of stuff that we could share and develop together if we actually sat down and said, here's what this is, here's, what, here's for this particular... This is our unit for geography for grade 3. This is our unit for geography for grade 4, grade 5, grade 6, all the way up. Here's our unit for biology, all the way up. Here's our unit for social studies. Here's our unit for history. So that we put these all together, we'd have one big database. And actually, I've seen a, a database years ago. I don't know if it still exists. The Gabriel Dumont Institute had something like this online. And it had everything like from making your own Red River wagon to another link in there to actually follow the the trail they had from Red River and then also making your own sash and then uh, different fiddle music, different dance steps. So you can learn anything and everything about, uh, I don't know about everything, but anything about the uh, Métis. And I thought that should, that was what I aspired to try and make was something that was organized about Anishinaabe people, that was accessible to all people that people would then come to this well, and I gotta go back to this metaphor of the well. You go back to it, you visit it, you find what you want, you bring it back out, and you actually go home, order your school, order your home, share with it, because then you use it up, you consumed it, then you go back to the well, you come back again. That's the idea, is what these recordings of these elders, are. there's always so much information in there that you can use, and just even if you're just looking at language structure, as a language, or if you're looking at it as a story, or you're looking at it as a philosophical teaching. There's different ways to interpret and use these materials that the elders are sharing that they allowed themselves to be recorded. So there's still others say, the other debate is whether we should be even uh, recording these things, and or not making them accessible. There's a lot of debate of what, what should be recorded or can't be recorded in that. But I, I think the the actual amount to teach our students and to, the amount to actually give and accord our language and our philosophy and our knowledge its proper due respect, then I think we got to actually record a bit more and work with it a bit, not a bit, a lot more. There's, like I said before, there's a lot of work to, a lot, a lot of work to do. So much, so much work to do that it, it it just astounds me that we're we're still we're still talking about the seasons, and we're still reinventing the units on seasons. Um, I feel like uh, we've been doing that for thirty years. Anyway, I just see it. sometimes I just see what the elders have told me, how much they shared, and it's just a drop in the bucket what we've been able to make convert into a usable unit to students. There's a big bottleneck there. And our language studies in different programs are, are, at this point, aren't varied enough to actually process all that information that, uh, that we want to make into units that actually affect Midamadzuan. 
that strive for minimadzun, and then also that accord that Nishnabe Kandasun, its proper respect. And we're not even really at this point implementing what we would call Nishnabe Kinamage with Nishnabe pedagogy. So there's a lot of work and lot, lots of work that needs to be done. And I know they tried this, I went out to a, a gathering out in Edmonton. And they wanted to make that place a national clearinghouse at the University of Alberta. And everyone, including myself, said we didn't want that to be the national clearinghouse. We wanted it to be an, an, a native organization. But we don't have the capacity to do that. Just to maintain a server, to maintain all those recordings, to maintain all those files and to keep them organized and to keep building upon them, you actually need a, a lot of... Uh, human resources and capital resources and just to complete the uh, updates, fix the bugs in the software, it's a big job. So you got to really, uh, it's no longer just putting up the VHS in a, in a climate controlled environment. It's no longer just putting up these uh, recordings, audio recordings in a climate controlled room. You actually have to maintain that and we, we need that. And I was, I wanted to try and situate a place like Ojibwe Culture Foundation as that memory institution. But what uh, that place uh, gets so un underfunded, all our aspirations get stunted by the practicalities of finding enough money, sustained, adequate funding, that we we never get we never get there. So I know your question is about uh, other than funding, what do we need? We actually need a lot of different people who actually have the diligence, persistence to sit there and process information. Like I find, I find sometimes that people want just want a quick, quick uh, language lesson, and and then they're off. They and uh, I see this in a sense in the proliferation of uh, programs that are named in our language, but then they actually aspire to know what that word means in that particular program that they've made the, and the people that implement that program don't really understand what the name means. So I think we, the language now is shifting into more of a, of a symbol of a, it beca it's become sim symbolic instead of actually something that you actually implement and, and that it actually drives the whole program. So I just see that all over, that people are willing to use title, make a title of their work on this, and then they'll expound upon that word, that Anishinaabe word for two, three pages of what it means, and then the rest of their paper or essay is, is, is all in English. Well, the whole paper is in English, except for that one word, and they talk about how deep that word means and what it means. and but then they don't actually take it to the next level of what, then there's actual, it's, it's like a, a ripple, it's like concentric circles. When you put that in, that word, then the meanings actually that come after it, that you're actually supposed to peel back and find more and more meanings of that word, the concept, its philosophical meaning, its cultural meaning, its etymological, etymological meaning, all these different things, we don't actually put that all together. And, uh, and let alone do that in Nishnab Emwin. That's what we should be striving for in our university programs. But now we're playing, we're so far behind, we're actually playing catch up to try and get that far. All the stuff that we're talking about, like treaties and geography and biology, that should actually all be covered as a foundation in our grade school and secondary school, in our language and taught in our language as a medium. But that is, we're not there yet. And then when we get to university, that's when we can have these deeper philosophical discussions. And that's why it's important to record those elders, because some of them that really were masters of this are gone now. And uh, if some of them, I know, I know some of them, and they didn't allow recordings. And I don't know now how to convey what they know. And I meet, peop meet different people who say they've met the same, the same teacher I had, and they're saying, to me, contrary stuff that he would say. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, 
I think this guy is just using his name because uh, that old man used to never say that. And in, in fact, he would say the opposite. But anyway, I just think that uh, when we record people, then we're, we're, we got a real sample. And then that actually is going to be what we would then use. Because right now, there's just too much of a bottleneck. We got to do this maintenance, preservation, and enhancement all together at the same time. Preservation is the easiest thing, and that's why I've focused on it. But actually, actually, it also has a concrete product at the end of it. Maintenance is something where you're actually maintaining your language and your education. And right now, like you go to a sweat down here in the in the southern Ontario, nine times out of ten you're gonna hear it in in English. And uh, I remember one time I went to a sweat, and the fella says, forgive me, grandfather, son, for speaking this language, meaning English. And then uh, I went back there 10 years later, and he was saying the same thing. Forgive me, grandfather, for speaking this language. And I'm like, you had 10 years, you, you still can't say uh, grandfathers in Ojibwe, or you can't say forgive me. So there's just different things that we, we, we end up saying language is important, but then our actions don't prove that. So I, I, I see it ceremony-wise, I've seen it ceremony-wise, where we got people that'll say that language is important, and then, uh, but they, they haven't really put in an effort to learn a bit more, to actually say a bit more. So now on the other side though, I've actually been to different uh, ceremonies where there's younger people, and they're really picking up a lot of language and I've uh, there's this this fellow Monty Magaki and uh, Jessica Benson and Squanquat Menominee they're doing really good they're they're getting somewhere and then the other thing I I went to New Credit Miss Saga's of New Credit and this uh, lady she isn't young but she is an old leader she's, I guess she's middle aged like me and so she did a little opening prayer in Ojibwe and uh, so I thought she spoke Ojibwe, so I went up to her and I started yakking away to her. And then she says, oh, no, I, I don't understand what you're saying. And uh, I was like, oh, oh, wow, okay. I I thought you spoke because you, you did this prayer. And she says, oh, I, that's a, I've, I wanted to learn how to say that, how to do that. And she sounded really good. She was, she was able to do it. So some people are serious about it and learning and practicing and and they'll do it even if they're going to get laughed at. And that's the kind of effort we need now for this indigenous education to really take hold in the next 10 years. So I think there's actually a lot of materials that are already there. One of the things, though, is it isn't organized. There's so much material out there, language materials, stories and stuff. It just isn't organized. There's, there's no place. There's, you have these clearing houses, uh, like, uh, I think it's called... Uh, Zalge de Win in uh, in Naughton, Whitefish Lake, and it's a clearinghouse for health information. Now, whether or not that's actually uh, still a useful kind of paradigm or a useful institution in the sense of given the internet, because that thing was founded, uh, I don't know if it was founded in the early 90, late 90s or whatever it was, but right now, you know, we're into databases and stuff and finding stuff online and so you actually, if you hit, if you go on YouTube and you hit Ojibwe, you're going to get a lot of hits. But what's happening is you don't know, you, you watch those stuff and you hear the, the majority of that stuff. I, I did this just for the hell of it three years ago. I went on YouTube and did that. And then I had all these things. Ani, Anishna, Anishajimadzian, Anishajnakazian, Abhijabinjabayan, Abhijanjabayan, Waneshgadodem. I don't know how many times I, those videos said that. Lesson one, and that's it. No lesson two. Then the other thing. So you go all the way up. Then the next thing is colors. So you don't have, you go on YouTube to learn different things, but you actually don't have that organized to say, okay, now you, you've done this one, now go to this one. You've done this one, now go to this one. There's no actual overarching organization to those videos on YouTube that you, you actually need to be able to sort out which one is right for what you want to learn, right for where you are as a learner. And then again, this comes back again. As a learner, if you're an independent learner and you're on YouTube, you're trying to use different information, 
that's when this word again that comes back that I call that we call in our language kinomadwin. It's a reflexive thing. You're looking for that teaching and that teaching is gonna teach you. It's a reflexive thing. Kinomadwin. You go on YouTube, you look for that. You find that video where somebody's talking, then you take a bit of that in, then you think, Okay, now I can go further with this. But we need an overarching organizational framework for what all the information that's out there. I always wanted to make this thing Merle, the late Merle Essence Beattie made this book called uh, Shkin Tam Mountjidin Dodem, Dodem uh, what's it called, Dodemak Our First Family Gathering and it was a real beautiful book and it's out of print now but we don't use that in our classrooms that's the thing that we should be using in our classrooms and then Rhonda Hopkins made these nice simple readers and uh, beautifully illustrated as well the Benjigen Gaumijit what the Creator had given her, that's the, the thing, and it was about uh, life. It was, again, beautiful, beautifully illustrated, simple story, but complex language and the deep teachings. But again, those are, those are out of print, and we, we don't use them. Then we got other stuff that's really dense writing, but we don't know how to have kids, it's not graded writing for kids. And this one's called Bird Talk by uh, Lenore Kijik Tobias, another beautifully illustrated book and a good story. But the language in there is too too complex for, for kids in grade three, four, or five. So we gotta we gotta pare those down a bit or, or categorize them to actually make them match the learner. Again, to match the learner and where they are at. So there's a lot of information, there's a bunch of resources and I just think Somebody's got to go through and make a big thing. There used to be a, a website that was pretty good. I haven't seen it. I haven't been checking it out online in a while. And it was this guy, I think his name was Rob's Ojibwe language page. It was just something like that. And he had a bunch of links and he had different uh, commentary and he had a message board. I used to go on that message board about 20 years ago. And then people would be just asking simple questions. And then I was answering and I felt good because I was able to answer. Then after a while I noticed, uh, holy, I'm spending a lot of time on this just answering people's mundane questions that, you know, they should be able to answer themselves. And then I started noticing that the actual questions ended up becoming the same. So there was a cycle of questions that kept coming back. Anyway, I went back on there about uh, maybe seven years ago. I found the site again. I just went through that message board and I was like, holy shit, these are the same questions that they were asking 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, things don't really go too far. So for that indigenous education, what I find is uh, we, we, we don't have, at this point, we've got a bunch of materials that are made and then a lot of these materials just get stored on shelves. But we got to actually look and think, take an inventory make a critical inventory, make an annotated bibliography, and actually honestly uh, honestly assess it to say, well, this actually could be used for grade five if this and this and this were done. Or this is too complex, we got to make this part of the university program. Or this one would be useful for a program, alternative education program. So we don't actually have that right now, where there's a whole set of Ojibwe language materials that are all there, that actually are categorized either as teachings, as as uh, Ansuk Khan, or Kinamadwanan, or Dabajamawanan, or games. We don't have that. We need somebody to get through and put that all together to look at that in that sense.